What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It is. Uh, it should be Thursday, tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That's when we're recording it. It's uh, Henry Zamoda and Daniel. Did I say Daniel? You, you like said Danny it again, Mark. dude. <laughs> Danny Abdul Jabbar. I'm sorry, Abdel Jabbar. <laughs> Abdel Jabbar. I mean, I've known you for years, and I still say your basic your name's right. That's okay. Uh, In the last episode, wrong. you said Henry Zamodi, so it's fine. <laughs> I can't even get my own name right. So that's <laughs> that's a tr- that is a uh, very big problem when you're when you're podcasting. If you can't pronounce, especially when we do such so many things in the Middle East. You know, how are we supposed to pronounce these names, these Arabic names, and not be able to, at the same time, I can't even pronounce my own name, so. <laughs> I think we is... spend a little bit more time focusing on how to pronounce the Arabic names than we do on our own, so. <laughs> well, what I'll do is that I'll actually throw the name into YouTube, and um, I'll listen to somebody else mispronounce it, so I'll just copy <laughs> them. If I'm, I'm sure, if I'm unsure about a name, I'll throw the name into, like, some type of pronunciation thing, and then I will, it will still be right. Uh, I'd still be wrong. Um, <laughs> it was not funny. This wasn't funny, obviously, but something that was kind of funny. I'll just say it. when Jamal Khashoggi, oh yeah, uh, unfortunately was murdered. Yeah, um, there were some people who would call him Yashogi, like Jamal Yashogi. Mm-hmm. So whenever I would talk well, to them, I'd be I like, heard a yes. lot of uh, Kashishki. <laughs> Kashishki. Uh, that's not the right one. I think the real way is Yash- Yashogi. So whenever I would speak to somebody who was just a lot more well versed in Arabic. Um, they would always refer to him as I'd be like, Yeah, so Jamal Khashoggi like, yeah, so Jamal Yashogi and I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm mispronouncing that incorrectly. But there's a lot of there's a lot of names in the Middle East that you can kinda of, you get confused and people pronounce different ways. Um um Qatar and Qatar is a big one. <laughs> yeah. How do you say that's it? a lot. Yeah. How do yeah. you say Qatar or Qatar? Uh I move between the two. <laughs> I don't. I'm not consistent on my pronunciation of Qatar Qatar. You know, it's funny. I do the same thing. I I move between the two. I'm not like married to one of the pronunciations of yeah. Qatar. I think yeah. right now I'm on a Qatar thing. Qatar, uh, Qatar. I'm gonna call it. But I'll go a couple of weeks. Well, when I call it Qatar, so Cutter. I don't know which one's right, Qatar or Qatar. Tell us in the comment section. Yeah, Qatar or Qatar. Like Qatar, as in like. Cutting her or cutting her or Qatar like, as like in, guitar with a K. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which one's right. Um, all right. So what is today? We are talking about the stolen painting. Well, not stolen. What am I talking about? It wasn't stolen. It was purchased. Um, the Salvador Mundi. Am I pronouncing that right? Salvador Mundi. <laughs> Salvador is not Mun- Mundi. All right. The Salvador Mundi. Are you, sure about Mundi. Are you sure about that, Danny? It's yeah, not dude, Mundi. It's, it's, Inta- it's Italian. You're you're Amer- you're anglicizing it right now with Mundi. Mundi. Oh. Okay. The Salvador Mundi. So um, for people who aren't familiar with it, so the Salvador Mundi is this really beautiful painting of Jesus uh, dressed up in Renaissance gear. And uh, it was apparently it was painted by Leonardo da Vinci in the fifteen hundreds. It was uh, Evidently. Evidently, I think there was some back and forth between uh-huh. who was the actual artist of it. Is that right? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I saw like a Vox thing on this like a long time ago. And uh, it was like this art historian dude. And it's actually really funny. He was like ripping on it, saying that it wasn't. And the main reason he gave why it wasn't um, a, a true Leonardo was because all of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings of human beings are always like to the side or like turned or some shit like that you know like they're never just full on front facial and he was also pointing out something about the guys uh the hair on the painting uh didn't look like um the hair in other salvador uh in other leonardo da vinci um paintings so i actually went back and and watched the video before this uh episode just to you know, get a refresh on like why people were saying that. And it evidently Vox News uh, just updated the name of the uh, <laughs> of the video to why the Sal- uh, the Salvador Mundi has gone missing, even though that video has nothing to do with Salvador Mundi going missing. And this was made months ago and it was made and posted months ago before it went missing. So I'm like, you're just clickbaiting right now. I didn't really love that. 
And what's even funnier is that in like the first post on the top, like the top link that you uh, uh, in the comments that they that they uh, pinned was a video uh, on the same topic, the Salvador Mundi, but it's like a different guy saying that it definitely is Leonardo da Vinci. So I'm unclear. <laughs> I'm not sure. Where, you know, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Who knows? <laughs> well, whatever it is, it was branded as a da Vinci. Yeah. Yeah. So. That, that's all that matters. Is Either that way, the, at this it, it point, it's, it's worth $450 million. It doesn't matter who painted it. At this point, it's the most expensive piece of art. So Yeah, it could be by Michelangelo, Leonardo. It could be by any, anyone. Um, it could be by point. some it random sold... like peasant in the 14th century, 15th century that just was good at painting. <laughs> yeah, know? it really could have been anyone, but it, it apparently it's a Da Vinci. It was sold as a Da Vinci, like the right. person who bought it. Um, spoiler alert, it was MBS. Uh, the person who bought it bought it because it was a Da Vinci painting. It wasn't because it was some random peasant in the <laughs> middle of Italy. Um, right. Like my my uh, great aunt was a wonderful, wonderful painter. She was a, she had she's just great painter. Beautiful works of art. She wasn't a Leonardo da Vinci, so her paintings aren't worth millions and millions of dollars, unfortunately right. for me. I wish she was, but unfortunately, <laughs> no. She, I think she came from a bunch of peasants in Poland, to be completely honest. <laughs> so <laughs> Maybe her ancestors studied under Leonardo da Vinci because apparently one of those... Um, one of the uh, uh, um, ideas is that perhaps it was done by one of Leonardo da Vinci's students in his studio, and like maybe he helped him, but it definitely wa- it wasn't his. I don't know. There's a bunch of like conspiracy theories about it. It's like uh, birtherism for the art world. Well, regardless, the painting is a breathtaking painting. Oh I think, yeah, it's I dope. think we can both agree with it. It's a beautiful uh-huh. painting of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, you know whether you're Christian or not. It's just a, it's a very fine painting. You can tell that there was a lot of work, um, absolutely, and not only the original painting but also the restoration of the project. Yep. Yep. Um, the team, I, I believe, when they got this painting, because it passed down from centuries. Like this was this is when you think about a piece of art coming from the 1500s, right, and making its way up to now. It's not a stone marble. Like it's a piece of paper. At the end of the day, it's a piece of partridge or whatever you put paintings Parchment. on. Partridge Parchment is a bird. Part, a partridge <laughs> family. Um, <laughs> what do you what do you paint on? Canvas. What yeah. do they paint on back in the day? So it's a piece of essentially paper that has to travel through time. Um, you have to imagine how difficult it is to make it in, in one tact. Like I can't write a note on my desk without snot being smeared on it (laughs) five minutes later. So they had to do a lot of restoration. I think the, the background of this painting is that it was commissioned for, um, apparently this is a story, you know, who knows what the actual story is, but this is the Wikipedia version story. This is as much research as I, as I really did on the, on this, the Wikipedia (laughs) version. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, commissioned to, to uh, for Louis the Twelfth of France, uh-huh. um, and it was in the possession of the French royal family for a while, and then through the marriage of Henrietta Maria and Charles I of England, uh, it went into English possession, and it just passed down from from uh, I guess person to person to I guess whoever thought it looked nice in the in the in the castle until it ended up in uh, a collector's hand in the 19 the early 1900s who in the painting this is a funny part the painting was auctioned off in 1958 for guess how much not a whole lot in dollars just just guess uh well you made a video on it earlier so i think it was like what 60 bucks or something like that 45 pounds Wow. This thing was auctioned off for forty-five pounds in nineteen fifty-eight. That's sixty dollars modern-day money, um, adjusting it for inflation. That is adjusted for inflation. No, without adjusting it for inflation, that's uh, just forty-five that pounds. One, one, what, what, from the fifties? Well, it's far less than four hundred and fifty million dollars. That's the point. Oh yeah, I know. But for the sake of accuracy, let me Google that. Um, it was. Uh, 1950 to 2017, one British pound. Calculate. It's uh, 32 British pounds. So if, if it was 45 British pounds, that's 
1465 british pounds and uh that is how much in dollars for our americans how much in dollars i'm about to find out right now it's it's 1931 dollars so just under 2000 bucks damn it's good money for back then but not that's great money for back then but damn inflation sucks doesn't it yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) we went from six we went from what 19 did you say 1900 or did I hear you wrong? Nineteen hundred bucks. You nineteen hundred to six nineteen hundred to sixty dollars. Yep. And that's 50, a that's a years. problem of itself. Yeah. But damn, that's that's a striking number. But whatever, nineteen hundred dollars. All right, someone made a quick buck off of it. It's like pawning off your your car if you're desperate for money. We've all been there, right? I've well, I mean, there. I feel like it would be more than pawning off your car because you got to remember while while that's the equivalent today, the cost of living was much less than two so like everything costs less than two so i I wonder what that with the buying power of you know that 45 dollars 45 pounds was in the 50s i'm sure you can get a whole lot more uh then with 45 pounds than you could today with 1900 us dollars yeah well whatever it is it's far less than what it was what it was worth the value of the painting after the restoration but (laughs) yeah the painting ends up somewhere and um, it somehow ends up in this, uh, I believe, uh, in a state in Baden, in um, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And it's sold off at an auction for $10,000. And I think this is 2005. Nice little profit. All right. So that's, some, that's a good profit. I mean, the yeah. person, I think, who probably owned the painting probably passed away. So it was a nice little it was an estate package sale. in the estate. But mm-hmm. I guess this this painting, and I looked at the pictures of the painting in its uh, 2005 form. It looked very different. It looked, it didn't look Crude. like it was holding up too well. But I guess it had this mysticism about uh, of being a Da Vinci piece. So everyone's like, oh, it's a Da Vinci piece. It's a Da Vinci piece. So... The painting ends up being restored, and they do a a, a wonderful job. Um, I just want to shout out the lady who did it because she, I, her team did it so well that she deserves recognition for it. Um, Diane uh, Modestini, mm-hmm. I believe, was a lady in charge of it. I think she, she's based out of NYU. Mm-hmm. Um, but her team, they made this thing look like it was straight out of the the, the Louvre, like it looks like the Mona Lisa. So they restored it, and it looks. I mean, just Google it. It's fucking awesome. I gotta yeah. stop cursing. I've been I've been uh, critiqued for that. Um, <laughs> so this thing is uh, so fully restored. It sold at a exhibit in 2017, and it sells for 75 million dollars. So we're going from a jump from 10,000 to 75, 75 million mil. that's 75 huge. million yeah that's huge after after the restoration takes place just that's based off the mysticism of it being a da vinci piece which i mean i have i have no idea i'm not i have no expertise in art or anything like that but so it jumps up in price and um i guess this guy who or who or whatever group bought this painting um they were trying to push it, and they ended up selling it for four hundred and fifty million dollars to a Saudi prince, and that's where we are today. And that's where we're at today. And um, the Saudi prince, the spoiler alert, wasn't purchasing it. I guess the Saudi prince came in and said that he was purchasing it on behalf of uh, like the a, a Saudi culture and exchange program. Mm-hmm. And I guess this, the Saudi culture and exchange program, um, their intention was to place the painting in the, the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Right. Which is, I didn't know there was a Louvre in Abu Dhabi, but apparently they, the Louvre, uh, they license out their, their trademark so you can open up a Louvre anywhere. I'm going to make but the Louvre Bushwick. <laughs> the Louvre Bushwick. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they, uh, it was supposed to be there. I guess that was going to be his primary home. And um, it ended up, it was revealed pretty soon after that, that uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, was the guy behind purchasing it. Like he, he's the one who financed it, which I mean, basically means like 
the Saudi state financed it. You know what I mean? Like he's right. the crown prince. So the Saudi state bought it. Um, and I'm guessing that when you purchase a painting like this, the mindset that you got, that you, you have is that you're, 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 you're spending $450 million, but you're doing it for the world. You know, you're, you're doing, your vision is to, to, to purchase this and, and have it shared with the rest of humanity because it's such a priceless piece. Is that kind of, is that the mindset you think people have when they buy things like this or, or I, they're just throwing I it have, in a room? And I safe? honestly have trouble just wrapping my head around buying anything for $415 million, let alone a, a fucking painting that may or may not be a Leonardo da Vinci painting, albeit a beautiful painting. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. If 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 they if they were bought under, it was purchased under kind of like false pretenses, right? Like clearly, it wasn't being purchased for the Saudi arts and society and culture organization, whatever the hell it was called. Because where the hell is it? Nobody knows where it is now. <laughs> so I think you know he might have been just trolling the world, being like, "I'm going to buy the most expensive. I'm going to I'm going to make this the most expensive painting in the world, and I'm just going to troll everybody and make it go missing right after." Well, that would be a pretty big asshole thing to do now, wouldn't it be? <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially considering it, like, basically went, dis- it disappeared for, like, a couple hundred years, went, and nobody knew about it for a minute, right? So. I mean, I always imagine that if you're actually buying a piece, I mean, $450 million, as of right now, I feel like would be the absolute max that a painting can go <laughs> in, like, the next however many years like that's the most expensive i don't even know what the second most is i probably should have looked that one up (laughs) however 450 million dollars um i don't think you're finding another buyer for that you know what i mean like are you going to find someone who's going to offer you 700 million dollars for a painting is jeff bezos going to want to buy that maybe who knows (laughs) i don't think jeff bezos would do that I don't think so either. <laughs> but so Mohammed bin Salman is the guy behind purchasing it. So I guess for all intents and purposes, the property is his, and it was supposed to be displayed in the Abu Dhabi, uh, the Abu Dhabi, the Abu Dhabi. Um, so many difficult words today. Um, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, but it disappeared. They don't know where it is, and the issue is is that the Louvre in Paris is supposed to have this big exhibit. Mm-hmm. For the uh, the 500 year anniversary of Leonardo da Vinci's death, that's right. It's supposed mm-hmm. to be this big exhibit where they're gonna, I guess, display all of da Vinci's work. I mean, it is what I think it's gonna be what it sounds like, and that's gonna be one of their centerpieces. And the Louvre, France, is saying to the Louvre Dubai, like, are you joking? Like, where's the painting? Where's the <laughs> where is the painting? <laughs> <laughs> this is this this is huge because the Louvre is the most prestigious museum in the universe, you know. So it, it's like, where the hell is this painting? <laughs> there's gonna be millions and there's gonna be hundreds of thousands of people who visit Paris to see the Louvre, see that exhibit. Right. You know how many Leonardo da Vinci connoisseurs in this world are? Like, where is that painting? That's probably that's so much money that they're probably losing if they don't have access to this painting. Just think about all the travel and all the people who are going to want to see that exhibit. Right? Yeah, it's so, going to move around. It's it, going to move will, a lot of people and a lot of money around. You know? Exactly. It's going to move. It's going to move a lot of cash around in Europe. Um, like, if you were in Paris at this time, like you would have to see it. It would just be like we need to see that exhibit. So, the but, paintings. They don't know where it is. Uh, so I, I guess I I don't know. I'm at I, my is an open question. Where do you think the painting went? <laughs> I mean, where do you think the painting went, Danny? I feel like I feel like it was never meant to go into a Louvre at all. I feel like that was just like a stunt. I feel like it was akin to. Did you hear about this? Uh, the you know Banksy, the graffiti artist. You familiar with this guy? Yeah, I love uh, I like Banksy a lot. Yeah, so like Banksy did a uh, like a piece of art. It was like a little girl holding a heart balloon, and, the, and it auctioned for one point four million dollars, which was tied for his other most expensive artwork that he auctioned. And 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 literally, as soon as the the auction closed, it was rigged to shred itself. So basically, it ran through like a shredder, and he just trolled the shit out of somebody 
and they bought a $1.4 million like just shredded piece of paper. This could be like one-upping Banksy. Like MBS could just be like, oh, that Banksy guy, he, he, I, I like that. That was hilarious. I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to do something better. I'm going to buy this painting for $450 million and just make it disappear. Wait, wait, <laughs> Banksy did that to somebody? No, no, no. Well, yeah, I guess somebody did buy it. Um, so he, uh, what an asshole thing to do. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Someone spends over a million dollars on a piece of your art and then you just, you self-sabotage it. So it <laughs> self-destructs in their hands. Yeah, yeah. That's, he, just, he's, that's uh, horrible. <laughs> he was making my some opinion kind of, of Banksy point, is you know? <laughs> really is is going down the tubes. <laughs> How do you do that to somebody? They spend over a million dollars on a piece of your art. You're going to self sabotage it yeah, just dude, to troll them. You got to you got to see this video of it. It's like it's in this like big frame, right? And then the second that you know the the thing is over, it just moves through the you know the thing comes out of the bottom of the frame and it's just like shredded like you know straight lines or whatever i suppose you could reconstruct it but um but yeah who purchased it ah that's a good fucking question um was it a saudi prince (laughs) if it was that'd be hilarious is it Um, like payback well evidently um (laughs) that would be hilarious you know, I'm not seeing who bought this. Dude, thing. if it was a Saudi prince, that would be hilarious. All right, let's uh, let's just let's just peddle that that piece of bro history uh, and say that uh, he it sold was a it. Saudi prince who yeah, bought the Banksy, prince. and yeah. it's it's, re- it's a revenge. <laughs> um, I don't know. I I have zero clue. It just it seems like it's 450 million dollars worth of collateral for something like it's like a really really valuable asset to have, but. I mean, a painting, like, the volatility on that is, like, it, art is only worth how much someone would buy for buy it for, you know? Like, what if somebody finds out that Da Vinci was, like, a pedophile or something? <laughs> like, the value would go down. No one would want it anymore. So, I, I don't... Our men shit. I don't, I don't seem like a stable... I don't know anything about art. Maybe, maybe it would go up. You never know. Maybe it would. Maybe maybe it would. Most artists are, are sickos, um, but uh, not to throw that thought out there, but uh, it's probably in Mohammed bin Salman's uh, $500 million yacht. Probably. Or his uh, $300 million chateau in France. I just, um, I just learned something literally right now, so I'm trying to find this fucking who bought this Banksy painting and the only thing i can find so far is that it was it was uh um so it was shredded by a remote control by a person in the sales room but i literally cannot find who bought this so and if if i remember from when they purchased the the um the salvador mundi it was over the phone like had it had an auction guy in the room and they called him up over the phone. I don't know how I'm making this connection here, but I don't know. I'm starting to feel like starting to feel like this this might be this might be a thing. You think it's like Ocean's Eleven, where he when he was robbed when Aunt, you see Ocean's Eleven? Have yeah, you seen it? Yeah. His big his one of his big concerns after he was robbed was uh, it getting out in public because he didn't want to be in publicly embarrassed <laughs> that he was a. Uh, that he was suckered. I mean, maybe. Who knows? Hey, it, it seems. I mean, that's definitely a suspect. If you're gonna, if you're gonna draw a list of suspects of somebody who bought a high priority piece of art that self, who <laughs> it, it would probably be a Saudi prince. But uh, maybe, maybe it was. Banksy was uh, doing it for political purposes because you know Banksy is like a huge anti-war guy, you know. Right. And he he's a big activist. Uh, maybe he was protesting the Saudis, and he knew they were going to buy it, and he did it on purpose as a protest to the Saudi regime or the Saudi dynasty. Do you think so? Huh? I uh, think, are we on to something? I, I I think this is it, man. Is this is this, this investigative is, journalism? I think so, man. I think we just broke the newest news story ever. We're we're tying in, like street art, Banksy, you know, to MBS, Saudi Arabia. They're related somehow. 
I think it's all. It has to be related. I think this is. I think Russia's in there too somewhere. Oh, they have look to hard be. enough. Russia's I mean, got to be in this. This is such a juicy story. You know, it probably has Rachel something Maddow. to do. Rachel Maddow. <laughs> Rachel Maddow. Do you want your ratings to go up? Pick this story up right pick, now. Pick, have us on the show. We'll we'll gladly come on to to explain our our findings. Rachel, 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 Rachel. You gotta look at the art. You gotta look at the art. You gotta follow follow the paper trail. <laughs> Follow the How shredded paper in- trail. <laughs> How do we get Trump in here? Uh, well, you can't get Trump in there because Trump is tight with MBS. Oh yeah, that, that's an easy that's an easy correlation. It, you know what's funny though? After all this kind of all this RussiaGate with all this this collusion stuff between apparent collusion between Trump and Putin, they could have they could have uh, it would have been much easier to to draw up the lines between the collusion between Trump and MBS. Like there was a direct collusion right there that was in plain sight. Yeah, and no one ever wanted to talk about it. His son, his son-in-law, is good friends with the MBS. Um, he regularly makes visits to Riyadh. Mm. They're drawing the the the, the Israel Palestinian peace plan together. Yeah, sure. Like you could have lo- <laughs> you could have looked there. It would have been a lot easier to find. You some know what the, to- some you know what the difference is? Colluding force. You know what the difference is? Saudi Arabia is an ally of ours, and. We're cool when you collude with allies, evidently. There's a lot of reasons. Saudi Arabia, they buy a bunch of weapons from us. They allow us to put bases in their country. They control the world's oil supply. I mean, there's many reasons why we work with the Saudis. Well, if we're talking about Kushner collusions, you know, we also pointed out in an earlier episode that uh, the Kushner family is pretty tight with, uh, with Bibi. So there's also that. Yeah, that is true. They are very tight with BB. They're all actually tight because BB and Netanyahu are friends as well. Mm. I don't know. I think we're going somewhere with this one. We're untangling the web, man. I'm starting we're untangling. To... This is really how investigative journalism works, though. They just think <laughs> of conspiracy theories. Like, obviously, what we're saying right now, there's no evidence of what we're saying right now, and it's yeah. pure speculation. We're kind of making Full this like disclosure. a fun. This is a fun story to talk about, and we're just kind of imagining things. But um, I think it's interesting. I think it would be really cool. I think if we if that ended up being like the story that came out, if somebody just did an actual investigative piece on this whole mystery of where's this painting, and mm-hmm. they discovered that it was a plot to it was it, they bought this painting and made it go poof because they were taking revenge out on the Banksy painting that they were suckered into buying and self destructed. <laughs> I think that would make a a crazy movie plot yeah yeah let's let's write that script <laughs> yeah let's start writing it today don't steal it um okay so speaking of the saudis um i wanted to talk a little bit about yemen mm. because i've been contacted a couple of times or numerous times have been contacted uh for some of the videos and some of the podcasts that uh we've put out regarding yemen and I'm actually kind of thrilled about it because that means that there's a demand for the the uh, knowledge of what's going on there. And uh, there's really not enough people who are interested in the situation going down. I think that's really the problem. And uh, I think the issue is, we were talking about this earlier with Yemen, is that the theatrics aren't documented in this war. That's right. So Syria was all over the news. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone knew about Syria over the past five, six years. Mm-hmm. And the reason why people knew about Syria was not because they were interested in, in another Middle Eastern war. Uh, it was because of the the theatrics of ISIS and a lot of the rebel groups there. And it was very well documented. It was documented on a regular basis. These videos were on YouTube. There would be videos of people being thrown off buildings and beheadings and organs being eaten. And just it was just a bunch of things that were documented. Yemen, that stuff is actually going on as well. Um, The same type of brutality, the same type of carnage is going down in Yemen. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's. I I think there's this overall lack of documentation on it. So I think the story doesn't really get out there. And uh, because there's really a lack of interest there, there is the mainstream media can really just paint a very oversimplistic narrative on this war, which is a which I think is a huge problem because. Um, when people speak about this war, they paint this in a brush 
of broad brush strokes. A right? broad brush in the common narrative, unfortunately, is that it's a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and uh, that's not the case. From from what I've looked into, I I understand how you can make that connection of it being a proxy war, but it's ne- it's not really a proxy war. The war is a or the Houthi movement is an organic Yemeni's movement. It's not Iran. It, there, there might be some connection there, just because they're Shiites. But it's not a. There, there's. It's not he, the Houthis aren't Hezbollah. You know, they're not. Yeah, they're that's, not that's the a same superficial thing. look. You know, the connections I think are there, but they're they're not the motivating factors. The the driving reasons why this war is going on and why it's persisting for so long and why it's frankly so terrible. And like many, like all wars, there's never just one reason, you know. Right. Uh, when you look things up and, and you try to take a get a grasp of what's actually going on, um, there's always people who have like the answer. It's like, oh, it's because of this or that or that. And, you know, a lot of the times all these people are right, but it's always a combination of these things. Like, you know, the, I can go on about the reasons why I think there is a U.S. coalition behind Saudi Arabia and basically declaring war on the civilian population in Yemen. Um, I can go on for the geopolitical reasons, um, you know, be, is it because there's oil offshore, mm-hmm. because there's pipeline... Um, port there's, access. Uh, pipeline concerns, there's port access, there is... Um, there, there's they, they want to have a hedge against Iran if they close, a, a, uh, close the Strait of Hormuz. Mm-hmm. There's so many different reasons that they all add into it. That, you know, they're, they're, there's not just one reason why there's there's war there. So, I think the most important thing to concentrate on is uh, just understand that it's going on and uh, knowing what the current status is um, domestically in the U.S. Um, Right now, we're at a point where both houses have voted to end the aid to the Saudi war in Yemen. Both houses have. However, they haven't passed the same resolution. So, it hasn't gotten on Trump's desk yet. That's right. And what I think it's not by accident. There are, there are, unfortunately, there are forces that are intentionally sabotaging the momentum that these bills had. And um, you know, like in December, we, we've talked about this a number of times. In December, there was the Senate passed a bill um, led by Bernie Sanders and Mike Lee mm-hmm. and uh, and Chris Murphy. That that resolution, remember that? Yep. When Mike Lee got on TV and he's like. Uh, him and Bernie, I, I forgot who they're being interviewed by, but Bernie goes on and Mike Lee is like, I think I feel the burn. It was like, it was a nice form of... Uh, Damn right you feel the burn. Bipartisan. War, Yemen. <laughs> it, was, it was a nice form of bipartisan co- uh, yeah. cooperation between a Bernie rare, Sanders and Mike Lee. A, a rare, rare one as well. Cooperation, yeah. But what happened was that after it, it was it was passed in the Senate... Um, but the house, that the house blocked it. Um, Paul Ryan blocked the vote, mm-hmm. and he did it with the help of Democrats. So stopping the bill was also also bipartisan. So it's not just a Republican or Democrat thing, even though it is mostly Republicans at this point. I'll be completely honest. Um, I'll call a spade out when there's a spade, and. Um, that was a perfect time to actually pass the resolution because there was, you know, there was a handful of Republicans on board, but it got, it got, it didn't go anywhere. So after the House flipped to Democrat, when 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 Nancy P came on board, yeah, when Nancy P came on board, uh, they should have been able to have a clean vote. But what happened? Here is the here is what happened. It's, this is like a very, very manipulative and kind of gross political game to play when you think about this. Um, they were going to pass the bill and all this stuff, and I, like they had the votes, but the Republicans added irrelevant language to the bill about mm. anti-Semitism. Yeah. yeah. And everyone at the time in the House was like, okay, whatever, yeah, sure. Like, yeah, put it in the bill. But it messed up the bill for the Senate. So when the Senate looked at it, they were like, we can't work with this because the language isn't relevant. That's right. Because the bill has to go through the House and the Senate. Right. And the big thing was, was that because they added that extra language, 
it was no longer pr uh, privileged under the War Powers Resolution. Therefore, that Mitch, Mitch McConnell could then block it. Mm. So if they had voted on a clean, no more, you know, Yemen aid, that would have fell under this that same provision, the War Powers Provision, right? Yeah. And the main point of using a war, the War Power of Resolution is to be able to for, uh, they want to force a vote regardless of the majority leader. Right. Like that's the purpose of the War Powers Resolution, to force a vote. Like how is that yeah. remote how is that remotely okay? And, and you know, and coming in, coming back to this Yemen thing, you know, be on whatever side as you want of of the Russiagate scandal. That that was interest that's an interesting thing to block for political reasons, but like why would you want to block voting on stopping foreign aid to a war that's going on that's absolutely terrible that has severe human consequences well when you look into it and when you start like putting the pieces together it starts to become very clear like i guess we're going to talk about it um so in the bill there was anti-semitism language in the bill obviously mm -hmm. um let's be clear it was a completely political game mm -hmm. um house republicans were trying to divide democrats on support for israel that mm -hmm. was the strategy mm -hmm. to defeat the bill they wanted to say all right what we get all right the democrats have the majority right now we're gonna have to get them by d dividing them based off israel that's a taboo topic that we can probably split the, d the democrats in half with so this was also an attempt by the Republicans to, to win some Jewish votes as well. Why not? Because APAC just happened. And if you right. watch anything from APAC, it was just all accusations of anti-Semitism from the Republican Party on the Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, you should have saw this one. So Mo Brooks, who's a Republican congressman from Alabama, he literally read Meint Kampf. I saw that, yeah. On the House floor. I saw that. To compare Democrats. That was cringeworthy. And the media <laughs> to Nazi propaganda. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's bizarre. Yeah. But what's really interesting, I, I found. Um, so, I don't, like, most, the Republican base doesn't agree with this. Like, this isn't, they're not crazy, especially that main base that w was behind that kind of was like the engine for Donald Trump. That's right. And the, the, the base I'm talking about are like the Breitbart type, um, Breitbart kind of nationalist right. kind of base that, that really voted him in. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'll say populist base. Um, they're, they're not down with it. They're like, what the hell are we doing in Yemen? Right. Like, what, 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 who they're like, screw the Saudis. Like what? Why are we like that? That base? Why are we wasting taxpayer dollars on this? Yeah, bullshit? Ex yeah. exactly. And I saw this really interesting article from Breitbart a couple days ago about Ro Khanna. Am I pronouncing his name? Is Khanna, right? Ro Khanna? I so. Yeah, I think so. Um, Ro Khanna is a lead sponsor of, uh, Ro Khanna is a lead sponsor of, uh, of the bill in the house right now. And there was like this really positive article out of on Breitbart about Rokana. He's like, it was like, um, though he's a progressive, you know, you know, he still has interesting ideas. I was like, I was really surprised. It's like, whoa, that's a one eighty. <laughs> because like the average person can't say, oh well, you you can't look at what's going on there and like see the the death total see the uh, the amount of just carnage that's going on see the cholera outbreak see the little kids with bones like, who are boning. oh my god did you hear about uh amal hussein that picture of that one seven-year-old girl that came out in like the new york times a little while like last november do you remember this no what is it all right you should take a look at it and decide whether or not you actually want to put it in the video it is i'm not going to put any of these fucking, pictures in the video it's it's chilling dude it's really I'm, bad I'm not putting graphic pictures in in the video because I don't want to like sub. I don't want to force someone to watch it, like to to look at something. Yeah. Um, well, if you're interested and you're listening or, or watching, the the name of the girl is Amal Hussein, um, and you can find it on on New York Times uh, and probably all over the internet. Um, it's a little seven year old girl, obviously starving, and she she did pass away unfortunately, um, and it, it's just. You know, this picture is so, it just captures the, 
I can't even articulate this well. It's it's like how bad this war is is just encapsulated in this photograph. You know, like the human uh, um, cost of this war is just so well encapsulated in this photograph, and it's just to your point. You know, no one, no no reasonable minded person can sit back and and take a look at the you know the facts on the ground, the objective truths about this war, and be like, yeah, let's keep uh, let's keep supporting that. Yeah, no one can. And also because it's like there's more of a commonant. There's uh, people really aren't sympathetic to the Saudi causes. But you have to think about like why the different reasons why uh, the U.S. is behind the Saudi coalition in Yemen. And I think it's mainly, I think a lot of it has to do with Iran. Uh, unfortunately, they want to be able to paint up that bad guy that Iran, Iran, Iran's a bad guy. The other half is arms deals. Um, I think a big part of it, the geopolitical interest, I think the, the big piece, I think, is just the Strait of Hormuz. Um, there's also just like, there's, Yemen has natural resources. Um, I'm reading this book right now by Issa Blumi, who I think right now does by far the most work on on the subject of Yemen and uh it's called destroying Yemen how many times can we say Yemen in this podcast uh it's like a drinking like, game every time you like hear a, the word every, Yemen take a drink yeah every single time you word we hear yeah it's a fun drinking game you'll be wasted by but um, minute 15 <laughs> I would I think he's probably the expert right now on the war in Yemen um I've been reading his stuff a lot lately and a lot of it just has to do. It, it's like not. This war is not new. This this war didn't start in 2015. This war it started back in the 1900s. That's really kind of like the thesis of this book. Like the, the this is like an ongoing war over one, a 100 year period, and he uh, brings it back to like British colonialism and and um, the resistance from the people of Yemen and the Arabian Peninsula to resist certain aspects of European colonialism. And uh, this is like, the war is just a consequence of 100 years of resistance. That's kind of like his thesis of it, but I've been reading it. Uh, I would recommend it. I actually tried to reach out to him to get him on the show, but uh, I haven't heard back yet, but I will continue to reach out. Definitely. We went from a pretty dark topic, from, from a lighthearted topic to uh, a dark topic from a... Uh, We're going to have to uh, sandwich it out with something funny at the end, I guess, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so um, is there anything positive going on, going on in the world? Um, positive. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call this positive, but I laughed at it. Um, did you see the... Um, interview trump gave recently where he said the word oranges instead of origins when, oh, he did. When, yeah he was like trying to say something along the lines of like you know i question the oranges of the Mueller report and he said it like three times in a row and it was actually pretty funny <laughs> so uh, and then, like you can see on his face that he knew that he was saying it wrong and he kept trying to say it right uh and um on twitter i was looking at it and there's like a bunch of people saying like you know there's a bunch of people that say that he's maybe not in the right mental health state uh but like a bunch of people recalling recounting their own like anecdotal you know uh um stories of like oh <laughs> i remember when my grandma was going through alzheimer's like this is how it starts like can't say words and shit like that i don't know i thought it was pretty funny oranges <laughs> the well or- <laughs> oranges <laughs> oranges well i can feel that because i pr- mispronounce everything <laughs> all right here i have a good way to end today i have a uh, goodnewsnetwork.org up right now let's go through the let's go through some of the articles and share some positive experiences rather good. than depress good. everyone who's listening <laughs> to this podcast yeah we got it we got a good news what was it um goodnewsnetwork.org i'll share my screen mm, okay All right, goodnewsnetwork.org. I don't know if this is the uh, premier good news website. This is my first time actually looking at it, but I'm hoping to have some heart, to see a heartwarming story 
<laughs> that uh, can can end this podcast on a positive note. So, all right, let's let's look around. Um, all right, so first article: school district turns unsafe. Uh, wait, unsafe. School district turns <laughs> unsafe un- cafeteria food. <laughs> unsafe cafeteria. Food. I don't know why I say I don't. I read it. Unsa- I swear to God, I read it as unsafe cafeteria food. <laughs> You're turning it into a bad story. Oh, bad. I'm uh, just so black pilled that I can't. I'm turning this good news network into a bad news network. All right. School district turns unused cafeteria food into take home meals for kids in need. That's that's cool. That's good. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, totally. To let the kids get the leftovers. <laughs> Real good news. You should, the article should be school district sends leftovers to poor kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's this next one? All right. Peep in on this woman's live stream of a nesting bird box she designed to look like a tiny living room. All right. Huh? Also, also really creepily worded. Like That's really weird. Peep in on this woman's live stream. Peep it's like, in is on this, like this. A cam site? Like, are we going <laughs> to... Are we gonna watch this bird get undressed or some shit like that? I mean, well, you know when the the guy, the the copywriters and the, the people who are writing the article when they were doing the SEO and uh-huh. when they were tagging up the article, you know, peep in on this woman was one of the tag words. Yeah, for sure. So I have to question the person who wrote this article was probably a pervert. <laughs> All right, so uh, goodnewsnetwork.org is failing right now. Just so you know, we were two articles. Both have failed to bring any happiness. All right. IKEA has developed a curtain that reduces indoor air pollution. Indoor air pollution. Well, too bad that you have to go into IKEA to buy it because IKEA in itself, have you ever been to one of their warehouses? Uh, who hasn't? It's impossible not to, to just buy one thing. Well, it's not possible. I've been in I've been in one of their warehouses before. And when I came out, I had Ebola. E- so Ebola is that like Ebola and E. coli put together? Y- yes, Ebola. <laughs> <laughs> it was a disease only that <laughs> IKEA shares. So you know what? You should say that man has to go through polluted warehouse to get reduced indoor air pollution at home. <laughs> well, at least they have good meatballs there. <laughs> They do have good meatballs. All right. Let's see next article. Our new sponsor. Purate. Purate. The nutrition company on a mission to help others. Great. We got a. That's not good news. Paid. Paid advertising. Paid advertising right here. This next one looks interesting. Corporate masters are upon us. I got something. All right. (laughs) 13-year-old boy traded his Xbox and did yard work so he could buy his mom a car. Huh. Some shitty car if you traded it for an Xbox, right? What is that? A, what is that? A Toyota Tercel? What is that? Yeah. A? <laughs> All right. In fairness, that's cute. That's super sweet. But, like, for real, if his mom couldn't afford to buy that car, she probably also might not be able to afford the insurance payments, the gas, the maintenance of this car. I mean, good effort, dude. Good effort. But when you when you when you get when you get a little older, you start realizing that used old cars can often be a, a financial burden in and of themselves. Yeah, kid. Maybe you forgot to to sell the controller and the games as well because uh, <laughs> <laughs> seems like you got the raw end of that deal. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I feel like an awful person right now for doing this. <laughs> Just let you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Next article. His family passed up this record-breaking pearl from Aunt's estate, and it's now worth millions. In other I, news, MBS right. purchased that, that <laughs> and now it has gone missing. <laughs> That's why you have to keep records. <laughs> oh wait, it's record breaking pearl. I've read it the wrong way. Right. Man, I all right, I'm gonna give some some actual constructive criticism on, on goodnewsnetwork.org. I keep on reading your articles the wrong way. <laughs> your words are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> your this family passed 
I, I read it as his family passed away for some reason. I think that's like a black-pilled vision. That's just like my own defects. Maybe. All right, so next article. Counties with more trees and shrubs spend less on Medicare study finds. What uh, else is new? I mean, I suppose I'd have to figure out, like we'd have to read it to find out why, but that's kind of it's like, are they trying to pass off correlation and causation? You know, so like, does that mean that a bunch of like, you know, conservatives are just going to say, hey, f- screw Medicare. Let's just plant a bunch of trees because uh, goodnewsnetwork.org says it uh, reduces costs. <laughs> hey, 2020 candidates, if you want to win the election and you want to dodge the health care question, I have a new one for you. Just plant new trees. Right. Come right Lip. to you from goodnewsnetwork.org. Plant new trees, libtards. <laughs> yeah, this next one's actually pretty dope. When family can't afford motorized wheelchair for two-year-old, high school students modify toy car instead. I got noth- I see nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. Okay. Well, that's that's a nice story. All right. Let's see. Listen, next. listen to third grade teacher tell hilarious story of how she let her students down imaginary Oregon Trail. Well, I'm gonna. There's one huge problem with this. Mm. All right. So saying that hilarious story, and this is a female teacher, and her it's implied. Well, that doesn't exist because women aren't funny. So it's a lie. Ooh, careful there, Henry. <laughs> careful, careful. All right, here's here's how it works. I think it was Gavin McKinnis who said this, and I believe him. Um, he says that five um, percent of men are funny. It's only five percent of men are funny in this world. One percent of women are funny in this world. I think it's pretty. I think that's a pretty fair statement. Um, I'm gonna say hard no. There's no objective truths behind that. So, whoever said that is a fucking sexist pig. <laughs> I don't know. I think there's merit to it. 5% because there's only like three funny women. Funny, again, being subjective. Funny is not something that you can measure with a scale. And if you wanted to say, all right, well, what about all the funny men? They make lots more money than the funny women and there are more funny men uh, on my Netflix uh, shows. Well, that's just because of the patriarchy, okay? They're suppressing all right. women, all right? Sup- I know this show might be called Bro History, but we're not sexist on this show. God damn it. Jesus. I don't think there's a woman who listens to this show, Dan. (laughs) Danny. Dan? You're going through all the versions of my name now. I don't think there's there's five (laughs) women who listen to this show. I can name three right now. All right. Don't name them. (laughs) You're not – we got to respect privacy. Four. Um, All right. (laughs) FTC crackdown stops four major call centers responsible for billions of illegal robocalls. That's cool. Well, you know what? When government comes in and they start casting everything as illegal and they make different types of calls for young entrepreneurs illegal, it's just government stepping in and just taking away your money and spying on you. (laughs) I think robocalls are the bane of, of cell phone existence. I get them all the time. Um, they're not doing enough good enough job because I still get robocalls. Whoa, this right. one's crazy. Uber to launch new fleet of car piloted by specially trained canine drivers? Is this what the, the onion suddenly? <laughs> <laughs> all right, this one's actually really interesting. We got to look at this one. Yeah, let's find out why. Pilot by canine? This Is this the future? So you know how they say automation's going to take your jobs? Evidently, the dogs are going to take them first. Watch out, Uber drivers. I'd much rather get into a car with a, a beautiful golden retriever. Give them all the pets. All right. So Uber to launch new fleet of cars piloted by specially trained canine drivers. In a bid to attract even more customers to their platform, Uber has just announced that they will be launching a new ride service that allows passengers to request a canine driver. Huh? Yeah, when was this article written, dude? When was this posted? Does it have a Is post this a real page? website? <laughs> Did, let's scroll down. When, when is this posted? Because, honestly, this might be an April Fool's Day joke. Because there's no April way this 1st. is fucked. Is it April 1st? Yeah, dude. This isn't real. 
Okay, I was fooled. <laughs> Damn you, Good News Network. <laughs> you see how they lie to you? <laughs> did you? Uh, other than this, have you? Did you get fooled on April? Fools? Um, I was completely fooled. Uh, no, I was not fooled. Uh, the the more the moral of the story is to not be jaded over everything, even though there are bad things, because there actually are good things. Um, that wasn't meant to be like offensive. It was meant more so just to be like just to to spread humor on uh on the subject of like investigating and doing research on on war because it does get quite taxing after a while. That's I don't right. know if you agree. No, it, it totally does. Um, it gets it gets very sad, very sad to watch and listen to. Yeah, but um, you got to remember, there's always good things that happen as well. Uh, more people are literate than ever. That's true. That is true. Infant mortality rate is, uh, you know, declining. Infant mortality rate is declining. Mm-hmm. Um, what other good things? The miracle of the internet is allowing us to have a podcast. Game of Thrones oh, is starting Game in two Thrones. weeks. How could we forget? We really got to start doing some research, dude. Um, they made Seamless. Ah, yeah. Seamless is an invention. Yeah, that's a thing. Yeah. Uh, you can just get water by going to your faucet. That's been around for a while now, so I can't really throw that up there. And also not everywhere has that. So Not kidding. everywhere has that? Ye- Yemen probably isn't one of them. Uh, well, we destroyed their sewage plant, so they can't have it now. That sucks. That's the reason why they're, they're, they are uh, they have such issues with cholera is because they don't have clean water there. Because their sewage plants were intent were intentionally bombed and their civilian targets. Well, but um, you hear the sirens. That means that we're running out of time. <laughs> that means that uh, this podcast is about to be uh, locked up. <laughs> no, um, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. This is probably more of a more of a unique show. Um, but everyone who is listening and watching, make sure that you rate and review the podcast. Uh, we're still trying to get the ratings up here. So rate and review the podcast. Uh, and then, uh, Danny, anything to add? Uh, I want to underscore the fact that uh, the views of Henry Zamoda on uh, whether or not women are funny are not reflected by me. Uh, we are not a sexist podcast. <laughs> um, that was that was all a joke, all right? So I was, I was joking around. All right, these fucking sirens are coming after us, man. Let's end it. All right, peace.